All right. I got a request because there's a lot of people that believe that what's happening over in Israel is Psalm 83. And so I was asked to speak on that uh, by Rosa. I thought maybe she might be here tonight, but so far she's not showed up. But nonetheless, I do want to cover that issue because it is a big issue. And oddly enough, the verbiage that's used in the Hebrew language is very interesting. So without any further ado, I'm going to take you guys right to it. Ooh, hang on. Get rid of, I got a YouTube up. You know, they got anything and everything pops up on YouTube too. It doesn't never, it's not ever nice. So, pause that. Bring it over here. Come back to where you guys are. Share the screen. Here we go. All righty. An important thing is I got to make sure that you guys can see as I move around. Um, I'm going to pull you guys down to the bottom so I can see better what I'm looking at. All right. So anyway, what we have here, I'm going to I'm going to start off on the main part of the uh verse here a song a song of uh, a psalm of asaph oh god keep not thou silence hold not your peace and be not still O god for lo thine enemies are in an uproar and they that hate you have lifted up the head they hold crafty converse against thy people and take counsel against thy treasured ones they have said come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. Against you do they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have been an arm to the children of Lot, so I do you unto them as unto Midian, and to Caesarea, as unto Jabin, and to the brook of Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor. They became as dung uh, for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb, Zeb, like Zeba, Z Zumana, all their princes, who said, let us take our selves in the possession and the habitations of God. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, the stumbling before the wind, as the fire burneth the forest, as the flame that setteth the mountains uh, ablaze. So pursue them with thy tempest, to frighten them with thy storm. Uh, fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and affrighted forever. Yea, let them be abashed and perish that they may know that it is you alone whose name is the Lord, the Most High over all the earth. Now, interestingly enough, before I really get into breaking a lot of this down, I want to show you guys a little something else to go with that. Um, Okay, this here, 11Q5, is what this is called. This is the psalm scroll uh, that was found in Cave 11 uh, in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I am trying, the problem is on this particular one on this website, I can't blow it up to actually read it. So there's no way for me to be able to see it well enough to be able to even look at it. I'd love to be able to see it. In fact, let me just try this way. I doubt it, but I'll try it. Yeah, no matter how much you blow the page up, it still does not blow up the content of that scroll that's sitting there. But I did find a site that has translated it, and I'm going to use this one here mainly for one particular verse. That's verse 2. Uh, verse 3, they all translate this one wrong, but uh, both English, uh, you name it, they all get it wrong, but that's all right. We'll go into that and why in a minute. God, don't keep silent, don't keep silent, and don't be still, God. 
that's a little different than our traditional translation, or I shouldn't say translation. You got to keep in mind that's being translated from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text don't even agree in verse one. Obvious. Still, though, it's it's not like it's so different that it would matter, uh, you know, but it's just it is a little bit of a variant of what we have. But the next part, though, is important. For behold, your enemies are stirred up. Those who hate you have lifted up their heads. Now, I would love to be able to see this in the Hebrew language to, to, to verify that, because in this case, they pluralize the word heads, not heads, singular, what we have in the Masoretic text. Keeping in mind, the Masoretic text, that's the Hebrew version here, and the word right here, Rosh, this is a uh, document that's only a thousand years old. They completed this around the 10th century. So we don't have an old version of this other than the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls really trump anything that the Masoretic text has. And in fact, when they say the Great Isaiah Scroll, there's more than 2,000 differences in the Great Isaiah Scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls and then that of what we have here, 2,000. Now, some of those are misspelled words. Some of those are punctuation. Uh, some of those are, though, where the sentence is uh, partially missing. Maybe half of a sentence is not there that should be there, or vice versa, something was added that should not have been added. Now, that's just the great Isaiah scroll. There are other Isaiah scrolls that were found as well, that according to Rachel Elori, a uh, doctor at the University of Jerusalem, who clearly, uh, actually, I think she is uh, part of the University of Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe wrong on that, but I think so. Or is it Chicago? I forget now. I know I've seen her in so many different lectures, I forget exactly who she's actually affiliated with. But in her work, uh, she said that those other Isaiah scrolls have meaningful differences to that of our own Isaiah, and that each group had their own rendition of Isaiah. In other words, their own uh, translation version of it, whatever you want to call it. So I found that interesting in itself. Um, but in this case here, we have it translated, for lo thine enemies are in an uproar, and they hate, and they that hate you have lifted up the head. All right. Now that word that's lifted up is nasu. And it's actually they're using. Uh, again, they're putting the vowel in there for themselves. That vav at the end of nasu, it could be uh, a vowel to the left, a little dot to the left of the letter, or it could be over the top of it. Could be his head or their head. Well, most likely they hate you, so it's going to be their head. So that's kind of uh, uh, something that's considered. But then again, it's rosh, a single head. And I look at that, and I don't have that big of a problem with that either. Uh, but when I look at the Dead Sea Scroll version of this, and I see heads plural, that also brings a very interesting concept into mind. Uh, and when I say it brings an interesting concept into mind, because I'm looking at two different passages of Scripture, one would be singular, that would be from Genesis chapter 3, the other one from Revelation uh, I believe that's chapter 13, chapter 12, something like that. Let me just make sure, chapter 13. So we're going to examine both of these here to see where you can kind of get an idea of where I'm going with this as we look at that um, and determining which one is right. Uh, I'm going to think that it's probably going to be pluralized is the way it should be. And there is a great reason for that. Probably a lot of scriptures I don't have up here that I should have up here already. So uh, bear with me for just one second. One thing I do need to get. Give me one second here. Uh, no, God. Okay. All right, here we go then. Let's see here. Now, <clears throat> if you go, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, 
you know what? Okay, I, I'm getting ahead of myself in what I'm thinking about here. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you from among all cattle and from among all beasts of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Hold that thought. I got to go ahead and do it. So I can't, I can't get away with not doing this. Let me let's see here. Hebrew gospel. There we go. Ron, can you give me a thumbs up? Are you able to see the new screen on the scripture? If it is right, I wish. Okay, thank you, brother. So I just want to don't want to lose anybody as I'm doing this here. I think we need to go to chapter 23. I'm using the Hebrew Matthew in this case here because of the way it's translated. Oh. Every time I move you guys, I gotta move you again. All right, here we go. Get this scooted over, and then I'll move y'all back. All right, here we go. See what chapter we're in. 21. By the way, I did get last week's video up. I did a whole lot of editing. Boy, Ron, me and you do a lot of chitter-chatter in that one. <laughs> so. All right. Now to it sometimes you. happens, brother. I will tell you guys something, too. And this is interesting, Ron, because we were talking about my leg issue there. The nerves and everything are still working really good. It's just that fluid is what it makes it still hard from time to time. But I, I've got to control a lot better. But I, another thing that I discovered was I get sleepy a lot. And come to find out when your lymphatic system is all blocked up, it makes you sleepy. So I'm just beginning to think, well, I'm getting at the age now that you old guys fall asleep all the time. So, you know, but, but I'm thinking, gosh, I'm too young for that. Um, although Social Security did send me the letter about retiring now. So, oh, well. We're all too young for that, brother. You got that right. Okay. Let's see here. First 36, I think. Nope, nope, here we go, right there. All right, I'm going to come back to this in a second. I just wanted to make sure I have it there in place. All right, you're cursed, the serpent now he's talking to, because you have done this, cursed are you from among all the cattle and from among all the beasts of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of life, of your life. All right, now, he curses the serpent, but yet, when you look here, Jesus says here to them, you, have, you, you behave according to the deeds of your fathers. Serpents, seed of vipers, in other words, children of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of Gehenna if you do not turn in repentance? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds of Jews, therefore, behold, I am sending to you prophets and sages scribes and some of them you will kill some of them you will afflict in your synagogues and you will persecute them from city to city all right in order let's see in order to place upon you the blood of every righteous one which was has been poured out upon the earth from the blood of abel the righteous into the blood of zachariah the son of berkiah whom you killed between the temple and the altar so Jesus, and this doesn't matter if you're using the Hebrew Matthew or if you're using regular Greek Matthew that we have today, King James Version there, they're indicted all the way back to the blood of Abel. Well, you got to go all the way back to Genesis there where the serpent's beguiling Eve in order to be able to get that. I mean, it's taking it all the way back to that time period. Now, that's important because of the bruising of the head. We go to that verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's hatred. I'm going to put a hatred between you and the woman and between your seed, that's children, and her seed, okay, her children. And now they translate that, they shall bruise your head, but it doesn't say they in Hebrew. It says, and I'll highlight that for you. And I know you guys know this already. I'm talking to the choir here. Who? Hey, Bob Aleph. That means he. He 
will wound or bruise. They translate that bruise. It's like a wound is what it is. He will wound your head, singular. All right. But here's where it gets interesting. That serpent, he's got a singular head. His head's going to be wounded, but he's got children. Jesus claims over here in Matthew, after we see that he indicts him all the way back to the, to the killing of Abel by Cain, but he says, you are the seed of vipers. So they... You know, and and it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't hurt my feelings either way. Some people they they look at this spiritually. Some people look at it physically. I'm not. That's not that, to me. That's neither here nor there. Argument. The fact is, they are what they are. Doesn't matter to me which way people believe that part of it. It still remains the same. So Jesus clearly says, except they turn in repentance. That's kind of like the same thing that Cain was given. You know. When God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Remember that? He tells you after he's already killed his brother, he said, if you do well. In other words, that's almost like saying, if you would repent, you'll be okay. But undoubtedly, I guess he wouldn't. I don't really know the story behind whether he did or didn't. We don't, we don't have anything that really says what he chose to do. But clearly, by the time he gets down to the Pharisees, there, Jesus clearly links them as direct descendants going all the way back to that time. Now, whether or not, you know, for the most part, we look at that at Genesis chapter 6, uh, the giants in the land. That's actually in Hebrew, that's the word Nephilim. The Nephilim were in the land in those days. Uh, and it's actually not Nephilim, it's Nephilim, the fallen angels. They were there. They cohabitated with the women. They brought forth children. So we know for sure that that's where that bloodline got started. Now, in that case, now I want you to think about this here now, right? When we look at Genesis and he says to, you know, to her, he says, I'm going to put hatred between your seed, onto the serpent, and the woman's seed. Have you ever thought, now this is going to be one that will blow all these doctrines out of the water, right? And I'm not saying that these other doctrines are wrong. I really, I'm not saying they're wrong, and I'm not saying they're right. But I want to show you something that a lot of people are not considering. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, B'nai Ha'elohim, right there. The sons of God are actually literally the sons of the gods. It's actually, it's Elohim. It is clearly, it is a very unusual, by the way, it's a very unusual um, usage of Elohim. If you've ever noticed, and he, well, I say, I, I take, is there anybody here that's in here? Do any of you guys actually know Hebrew by any chance or a little bit of Hebrew? Donna, raise your hand, sister. No, I'm just kidding. It's just, just what I look up. Okay. All right. Would, do you recognize, though, when you're looking up, do you recognize Hebrew character letters like that? No? No, I don't think so. That's okay. I want I gotta show you something because this is something that a lot of people don't realize. Let me find, let me go, let me go back to Genesis 3. I should be able to find it over here too. Let's or no, let me go to Genesis 1. That'll be easier. Okay. All right. The Yame Oh, that's Genesis 12. What am I doing? I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, that's what God told. What's his face? You know, Abraham. All right. Barashit bara Elohim et Hashemaim. Okay, never mind. No, it's not. I stand corrected. It is the same. I was thinking that for some reason, what am I looking at different though? There's something to see different on here. Oh, I know what it is. I, I apologize. No, it's my fault there. I'm looking at the definite article, hey, in front of it. And that's the one thing, that letter right there. That's what threw me off. For some reason, I'm thinking in my mind, that's, see, that's where I'm dyslexic. That's the bad thing. I can't even spell in Hebrew, right? I was thinking there was no Yod in there. 
But uh, maybe in some cases that's the way, because I could have sworn Elohim is often spelled without the Yod, but maybe not. Who knows? Anyway, so, but the point I want to make, though, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took unto them wives whomsoever they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always abide with man forever, for he is also flesh, and therefore shall his days be 120 years. The Nephilim, all right, now they put Nephilim right there, all right? were in the earth in those days. But how many of y'all remember? I think it's in Numbers chapter 13. So let's quickly go there. We're going to bounce all over the place because it's very important we do this. Numbers 13. This one I know I got right. Here we go. All right. Nephilim would be spelled right here. You see those two little, those doohickeys right there. That's called a yod, the letter yod. Okay. There's two of those there. There's one right there, and then there's one right here. If you go down to the next line, there's only one. The other one between these two letters here, the fe, this is the fe. The next letter is a lamed. All right. There's no yod in between that one like there is up here. The reason being is because the children of the fallen angels are called nephilim. All right, the hay again in front means the children or the fallen ones, okay? But the actual Enoch himself, this guy right here, he comes from the, east. From, literally says mean, which means from, but they put the vowels in the wrong place. He's from the fallen ones, actually ha nephalim. That's the way it should be pronounced. Now, if you go back, into Genesis 6, it's the same thing. That, that extra yod that we see right here is not between the Fe and the Lamed. That lets us know it's not talking about the children. It's talking about the fallen angels were in the earth in those days. Now, here's the thing I was going to share with you that I don't think anybody's ever really thought about before. At least I've never heard this expressed before. The Nephilim, the fallen ones, Remember, Satan created a bunch of angels for himself, didn't he? Well, if say if the serpent has children, has anybody ever thought that perhaps his children are these fallen angels that came down to earth and cohabitated with the women and brought forth children with them? Yes. Maybe that's the seed. That's Maybe it. That's his children. But he mixed that bloodline there. His sons did finally come down. They did cohabitate with the women, created an offspring there. And so he does have children. And really and truly, in a way, it has to be a future event. And now here's the reason why I say that. Because even in the case of the woman, when it talks about that he will bruise, because uh, it says right here, he will bruise his head. Your head, literally, it means that little head right there at the end is for your, all right? He will bruise your Rosh head. He's going to bruise your leader, so to speak, your boss, the chief one for you, all right? So the serpent's got to come back, interesting, and because of that, her, the woman's seed is the one that does the bruising of his head. And you shall bruise. Now, it does say their heel. So I thought, found that very fascinating in the respect of that's exactly what happens when Jesus comes and he exposes them. And they do get the deadly wound because why? Jerusalem is destroyed. Now, but oddly enough, let's go back to Psalm 83. How does this play out with Psalm 83? Well, keep not silent, O God, and hold not your peace, and be not still, O God, for your enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate you have lifted up their head. Hmm. Literally, in the uh, Hebrew uh, or Dead Sea Scrolls is saying they lifted up their heads. 
if you go to Revelation, kind of jumping back and forth a little bit, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. They lifted up their heads. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, um, and we go down to that one verse I told you guys about so many times already here lately. And he, sh all right, but first let's back up. Thus he said, the fourth what? Beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. What does Revelation got? And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Daniel 7, the fourth kingdom, the beast, excuse me, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And as as for the ten horns, well, gosh, golly gee, what do you know in Revelation? How many heads has this guy got? He's got ten. Let's, let's find out, back up where I got to find it all, because I got to rise up out of the sea. Oh, no, I'm sorry, seven heads. And I'm sorry, ten horns. That's where the ten is, ten horns. And upon his ten crowns, his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. Hmm. Interesting. So, and I saw, verse 3 is important. When I saw one of his heads, plural, as it were wounded to death. Now, think about it. Let's go back, find the right spot. His heads have lifted up their heads, plural. But the Masoretics lifted up their head, singular. One of the heads, plural, are wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. No, it ain't Donald Trump. You don't get an ear piercing and call that a deadly wound, okay? So I hope nobody was dumb enough to go down that rabbit hole. And all the world wondered after the beast. According to Daniel, that fourth kingdom is a beast kingdom. But how do you know what the kingdom is or who the kingdom is? And he shall speak words against the Most High. By the way, he puts down three of his kings. So he's only left with how many heads? Seven. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change by the way, they do put seasons, and I keep saying the word seasons, but it's actually zamanim, times. They shall think to change times and the law, or in this case, the decree, the time and the decree. They think they can change the time and the decree, and they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a half a time. What is the decree that he thinks he can change? It's the decree of Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the one that gave the decree that from Persia, the children of Israel could leave and go back and restore Jerusalem and build the second temple. Hmm. So if he's going to change the decree, what was the decree he's going to change? He's going to change a wind, he's going to change the building of the temple, but he's going to change the time of when it's to be built. That is one of the ways you know who that guy is. Now, if you look at the Hebrew Matthew, for example, and it's verse 15. Uh, nope, 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 nope. Ron, we had this problem last week, the abomination of desolation, and it was in Matthew, but do you remember what chapter that was in? 24. It's in 24. Oh, somebody said that. Well, I didn't hear it. 24. It is 24? Yeah. 15. Two, yeah, verse 15. Am, am I in the wrong chapter? Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's why. Thank you. 
It's pretty close. Now, the Hebrew Matthew adds the word Antichrist. In the King James, we don't have that. We just have, this is the abomination that, that makes desolate. When you see the abomination which makes desolate standing in the holy place, then you know to flee, right? Well, in this one here, he says, this is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken by Daniel, standing in the holy place. Well, the Antichrist didn't come 2,000 years ago. The true Messiah came 2,000 years ago. The Antichrist comes when they thinks he can change the time and the decree of Artaxerxes. That's why Jesus says here, he says, Ze Antichristas ve Ze Shakots. Uh, sh well, I can't see it because it's all covered up over there. But anyway, this is the anti this excuse me, this is the Antichrist, and uh this is the abomination which desolates. The abomination which desolates is the Antichrist, which is interesting because a lot of commentators have figured out that the abomination of desolation is the Antichrist. They did figure that much out. They figured out even that Daniel chapter 7 is the Antichrist of the beast kingdom. Well, now you know that it's to deal with the building of that temple, right? But, so then let's look at Psalm 83. They have lifted up their head. What is really the lifting up of the head then? That the lifting up of the head is exactly what we have in Revelation. It is, and his deadly wound was healed. Where is his wound? One of his heads was wounded. It was wounded by Jesus Christ when he was here. And that deadly wound was actually when Israel nearly was wiped out as a nation. Well, actually, as a nation, they were wiped out. They weren't wiped out as a people, but they were wiped out as a nation. Then Israel becomes a spiritual kingdom. And the temple becomes the body of Christ. We as individuals make up that temple now. So now when you begin to look at Psalm 83, they have lifted up that uh, actually it should be not the head, but their head. Because that's what it says right there. It doesn't say the head. It says their head. They have lifted up their head, their leader, their king, their wounded head of the serpent of Genesis. They have lifted him back up and put him back into authority because one of the heads, because you got to remember his children, the fallen angels of Genesis chapter six, they already perverted the bloodline. And then what, and, and that was the, that, all right, think about it. They pervert the bloodline. Joshua comes in along with Caleb. They go down with the 10 spies and they said, you know, we're more than able, able to conquer them. They come back. The other eight spies says, we're like grasshoppers in their sights. They're giants. We can't do nothing to take over them. But not only do, does Caleb and Joshua steal the people and say, we're more than capable, more than capable. By, by the way, that is in the book of Numbers right here that we're reading it at, right? This is right where it's at. It, okay, let's back it up. But Caleb steeled the people toward Moses and said, we should go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they spread an evil report of the land which they had spied out unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have passed to spy it out, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. They were cannibals. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. You know, the, 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 see, the evil report does not mean they lied about that. They just made the people fearful. That's what they did. And there we saw the, the Nephilim, the children, in other words, of Enoch. And Enoch came from one of the actual fallen angels. This is why God told them, don't marry in amongst them when you go there. You know, I mean, you know, I, I kind of, one of the things that kind of blows me away. And maybe I shouldn't go down that rabbit hole there. No, oh. it's, not, it's just a funny analogy I was thinking about. It's not not some great mystery, so don't get worried about it. But I'm like, better that's not that's not a very nice analogy. So I'll leave that alone. Anyway, so 
let's just put it this way. You know, you have Great Danes and you have Chihuahuas, okay? The Nephilim were Great Danes and the poor, is, well, I don't want to make them look like, Chihuahuas don't really sound good for Israelites. Poodles, maybe. <laughs> they might not want to be poodles either. Uh, forget that. So I don't want to sound bad. So, all right. Nonetheless, so the point is the size difference was uh, unbelievable. But nonetheless, there was a cohabitation. I don't think, though, so much that, you know, the cohabit, because you got to remember, too, even when you go back to the time of Genesis, there's other writings that show that they were able to transform themselves to appear as if they were their husbands. So they literally could transform their size, everything, not to look like a giant, but to look no different than what their husband did. And I don't know how in the world they could do that, but they had that capability of doing that. And therefore, the women fell for it. That's how this all took place. Now, in the case of the days of Israel, when they went there, it wasn't a matter of transformation. I'm sure because the societies of those, the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, they had intermingled with those people. So not everybody there was necessarily looking like a great Dane, you know. There was some that I'm sure that were smaller type people, and they ended up marrying in amongst them, had children by them. The house of Israel did that first, and of course, God got very angry. So that's where all that comes into. So we come back to Psalm 83. And we see that they've lifted up their head. Now, in other words, they have now they what what they're done what they've done is they have now the deadly wound of the serpent is healed. We're in Revelation at this point, so they hold crafty converse against thy people. And typically, everybody is thinking the modern state of Israel, and I don't believe that's what it's speaking about. I believe it's talking about the people of God, the people of Jesus Christ, those that have believed him, because that is Israel. And Israel is made up of Jewish people as well, just as just like it is of Gentiles. There are many people that are Jewish that make up part of that body, but I don't think it's the state of Israel. And what really gets me caught on that one is this next uh, sentence, and took counsel against thy, they put on their treasured ones. It doesn't say treasured ones. Hmm. It is in the plural, Saphon is hidden. They take counsel against thy hidden ones. Plural is the Yod, your hidden ones. They took counsel against your, the word thy sometimes a little confusing, but you know, they took counsel, they, they, they've, they've, tried to figure out basically what are we going to do about the hidden ones they know they can come up against the people and destroy the people but then there's a big problem there's these hidden ones and basically it's like saying what are we going to do with them right who are the hidden ones well i think that's obvious and i'll take you right where i believe they are we're going to go to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to the book, chapter 11. And you now know where we're going with this. I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall be prophesied 1,203 square days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing on before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devour their enemies. I see why they would take counsel. Because the problem is they could try to destroy the, the children of God. But what are they going to do with these two here? Whether it be Enoch, Elijah, Moses, all three of them are hidden away somewhere. Moses, even though they put him in a grave, he was hidden. Nobody knows where it's at. So we know that Moses is hidden. Elijah went up in a chariot of fire. Nobody knows where he went. He's hidden. And Enoch, he was translated, went home to be with God, never tastes death. He's hidden. So the question is, what are they going to do? That, that, that's a big problem for them because they also know that when the hidden ones come back, they're going to rain down havoc they can't nobody deal with. So then let's continue to look at Psalm 83. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. 
for they have consulted together with one consent against uh, you. Do they make a covenant? That covenant that they will end up making, and by the way, when it says the tents of Edom, do you know where that comes from? Now, the, I'm sure they like to spin this around. The, the Jewish people, I know because I was amongst Orthodox Jews for many, many years of my life, they like to tell you that's the Catholic Church. And they're the bad guys, and the Ishmaelites are the Arabs, and we got to kill all of them. That's the way they that's the way the Orthodox community looks at it. But the tents of Edom Herod was an Edomite. Herod was Jewish. Tents, that's basically the house, in other words, what makes them up. It's their house, their being. The Ishmaelites, it doesn't matter what we want to say there. Moab, Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek. All these are just family lineages of all kinds of mixed up races and things like that. They just represent the people on a global scale that want to silence and annihilate the children of God. If you remember, Paul said, he that is Jew is not Jew that is Jew inwardly, but he is Jew that is Jew outwardly. It also speaks about that you are Israel. So I know that there's a lot of people that will probably disagree with this because everybody is trying to make Israel going out there and just totally obliterating the Palestinians in Gaza. And believe me, I'm not, I do not support the Muslim faith. But at the same time, I don't believe that we have a right to go out there and just totally annihilate these people either. But there's a lot of people that do think that. And then it's like, what good is the blood of Jesus Christ then? You know, when's the last time somebody really sincerely tried to take the gospel to them? Do you know that there used to be, I forget what the number was. It was a very high number down in um, in Bethlehem. Huge number of Christians. Israel has managed to drive them completely out of Bethlehem. The only thing left now is Palestinians, you know. And again, I mean, of course, the Christians were Palestinian as well. They were just Christians that were Palestinians. And they were in the tens of thousands. And I think now there's less than 2,000 remaining. The others have fled the country. So the whole point, everything that is being wiped out are the Christians, those that are the Israel of God. And I really believe that when it looks up, the lifting up to the head, we're looking at, especially, especially, this is what really gets me, right? If we're looking at, If the Dead Sea Scrolls really is, and, and I know they wouldn't translate it heads plural if it wasn't heads plural there. I just have not, before doing this, I could find it eventually. It's just I couldn't find it in time to be able to put this message here together. But when it put on there, those who hate you have lifted up their heads. And then I sit there and I could not help but think of Revelation. And it talks about this beast with seven heads. Ten horns. And it That's goes one world. Sorry? Seven heads is, a, is the world government we have today. Well, it's definitely, there, there's no doubt about it. That's And that's the whole point about it. When you look at all, like if you're looking at this in, in regards to Psalm 83, and it begins to name all these names here, naturally people will look at that and they would say, well, well Ammon is uh, Jordan. Uh, the Philistia is Gaza. Uh, you know, this is the way a lot of people would translate it. They would say Edom, they're going to tell you that's the Catholic Church. No. But really, what is it when you look at this? This is all the different peoples of the world. Edom is Esau. Exactly. Sure he is. But th what I was saying to you, though, what people don't seem to realize the priesthood in Israel back 2,000 years ago were made up mostly of Esau's children. This is why Jesus called them a brood of vipers. 
Okay. He knew that that's what was in there. And this historically, we know that that's very true. This, why do we, you think we had the Qumran community down there by the Dead Sea? They were the true Zadokite priesthood. They had to flee. They had no place to go. They couldn't live in Jerusalem. The Edomites had overtaken. Mm -hmm. you remember when the Maccabees came in? Do you know that the Maccabees, they were part of that mixed lineage that came back from Babylon? We know this because, uh, was it Jonathan Maccabee is, is recorded as being a giant? Yeah. yeah. He's actually, it's actually historically recorded that he was a giant. How did he become a giant? How did that happen, right? So, now here's the thing, though. Even Jesus says, like we read here in the Hebrew Matthew, he says, you know, how can you escape the judgment except you turn in repentance? So even though they may be half, you know, half of that serpent bloodline through the fallen angels that came down and cohabitated, there's still that possibility of repentance. And the reason being, because see, some people think, oh, they're all, they're a bunch of serpents. They can't never make it in. No, it's not. Now, in the King James, it does say, you know, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's what we read there. Now, it just says how. It doesn't say they can't. But in the Hebrew, Matthew, it said, except you turn to repentance. All right. Now, why would that, how can, why is there that possibility there's a repentance? Because either their father or their mother is from the original bloodline that comes down through Abel or through Seth. So, and really and truly, it comes down to what's in your heart. It's not what's, you know, it's just like in every human being, good and evil is always at battle within us. It depends on what side we decide to let rule within our heart. Are we going to let the evil rule within our heart, or are we going to let the good rule within our heart? Because they know telling what all is mixed up into us nowadays. But that's the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ, is he is merciful and long-suffering. Even with the Jewish people, I don't care if they're Pharisees or not. I mean, you had Nicodemus that had to come by night to get to Jesus, and yes, he was a Pharisee. And Jesus was, con he called all the Pharisees a brood of vipers, but Nicodemus made it in. Why? He found that way of repentance. He was willing to do it. Yeah. And that's what's important to know. So even though you, I may be strong and firm about some of the things that I say like that, at the same time, always keeping in mind that there's always that possibility of repentance. I believe we're going through this end time stuff I agree, now Donna. because Jesus wants us to, as many as possible that are even of the evil saint line, to turn back to him. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, and here's the thing, you know, we don't know what our fathers, 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 fathers did. Maybe one of them did the same thing. The thing is, there's so much mix up in there. That's why Jesus Christ looks at the heart. He doesn't look specifically right. at your bloodline. Now, like in the case of Israel, what is it? The, the people like Smotrich and ben Gavir and Netanyahu, they have allowed the evil through their lineage to dominate them, but they don't have to. There, any one of them, if they would sincerely turn in repentance, Jesus Christ would receive them. Right. And that's the thing that we got to always remember. Regardless of how evil somebody might look, there's always that possibility that they would return, they'll turn in repentance. That's what that's why Jesus or the scripture says the Father is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all might come to repentance. That's where that's at. Now, the difference with him, though, is he knows who's going to do it and who won't. He can't help that. He's God. He knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what decisions people will make in their lives. You know, it's not his will that somebody would make it, but he just knows some people are basically, they're just hard-headed, and they just know they ain't going to do it for nothing. But we don't know that. So it's our desire that we try to do everything we can to win every soul to Christ that we possibly can. Amen. Amen.